Well, thank you very much um, for the invitation, and uh, it's a pleasure to be here. <coughs> um, so, yes, uh, as uh, Mara says, my position is the coordinator for the business plan for the PMPA. And a lot of our experience, as you'll see from my presentation, comes from the work that we've been doing in Africa. Um, but I think certainly when it comes to biosimilars, it's applicable to a greater or lesser extent in other developing and least developing uh, developed countries. So I hope, whilst there may be some bias to my presentation based on our focus on the African continent, um, I hope during discussions perhaps we can um, extrapolate from that and see where there are learnings um, for other regions of the, of the world. So UNIDO has a mandate, or UNIDO's mandate, organizational mandate, includes the development of local pharmaceutical production in DCs and LDCs, de developing countries and least developed countries. Um, since the new Director General um, started his first term, the organization has um, developed a new approach or uh, has a new mandate called Inclusive and Sustainable Industrial Developments, which looks to address uh, industrial development in a holistic fa uh, fashion, recognizing the need for multiple partners and multiple parties to come together to address horizontal issues, infrastructure, energy, et cetera, et cetera, as well as looking at some of the um, sectoral, um, um, the vertical issues in particular sectors. This is the way this is actually, uh, the mechanism for implementation at the country level is called uh, the Program for Country Partnerships. Um, and this is being piloted in a number of countries. Peru, for example, um, it did originally come from the Lima Declaration in 2013. Um, it's also in Ethiopia and in Senegal. Um, and I've just come back from Ethiopia and the Ethiopian government has now decided to include pharmaceuticals as a priority uh, sector in its PCP. So that's one of four um, industry sectors. <coughs> How did I get there? Sorry, I seem to be pushing buttons inadvertently. Uh, <laughs> um, so as, as well as ICID, we have, uh, there's the third industrial development decade for Africa. So this was declared by the UN General Assembly in June last year. And UNIDO is tasked with, or shall I say the Director General specifically, is tasked with working with um, the African Union Commission, the New Economic Partnership for Africa's Development, um, and uh, other partners within the UN system as appropriate, and to mobilize voluntary contributions to support the industrialization on the continent. And the pharmaceutical industry has been identified as a priority for, for this continental agenda. And then at the, the most recent UN General Assembly, uh, there was a further declaration on industrial development cooperation. And within that includes a statement that the General Assembly welcomes UNIDO's support for the Pharmaceutical Manufacturing Plan for Africa. Now, which is a, you know, very nice, but beyond the sort of the, the, the recognition of the contribution UNIDO has made, I think what's important here is this actually puts to bed an issue that's been being hammered out from it for a long time within the development community about whether pharmaceuticals and the local production of pharmaceuticals is a suitable way to um, improve access to medicines. And there's been a strong nay campaign, a strong yay campaign with different sort of um, arguments from both sides. And I think this is now not been put to bed, but I think it is widely recognized now that uh, to borrow an African expression, if you teach a man to, so what, you give a man a fish, you feed him for a day. If you teach a man to fish, he can feed his family for life or whatever. So the whole point being this is a sustainable approach to improving access and also that quality should be absolutely front and center in the agenda. This isn't about providing substandard products. This is locally produced, high quality products. So since 2006, UNIDO has had a project on strengthening local production of essential medicines in developing and least developed countries. It's been largely funded by the German Development um, Ministry, BMZ. As I've said, the major focus has been uh, Africa. This is perhaps because of the, the Millennium Development Goals, HIV, TB, and malaria, but obviously being uh, particularly uh, devastating in sub-Saharan Africa. Um, but during the latter phases, we've, we've moved beyond just the three pandemics and now really look at the whole essential medicines list and generic medicines in, in general. I should say that the work that we've done to date has been um, on small molecule products. So. 
Um, I think we have a lot of experience in dealing with some of the medical and the regulatory um, institutions, um, the financing institutions, um, policy making organs of government and within the international community, but certainly the technical dimension of biosimilars and how that also has an impact on markets and other um, considerations is something which is relatively new to us. So as I say, a key for industrial development of the pharmaceutical industry to actually contribute to improved access, yeah, well, there are a number of key things. Uh, affordability, availability, um, and quality. So one of the things that um, I think in the past was suspect from, shall we say, the public health community was that the industrial development community was pushing for economic growth through the uh, production, export, or whatever, of products which were not necessarily the standard that would be required, shall we say, by stringent regulatory authorities in the West. Um, <coughs> certainly the work that we do, the emphasis is on the quality. Um, and I think there's a good argument for that, even from an economic development perspective. Why should one just be serving one's own markets? Why shouldn't Nigeria have an ambition to serve um, uh, European markets? Bangladesh already um, supplies Europe, I heard just now. And we certainly know that northern African countries, Tunisia, for example, is exporting into, into the European market. So um, this notion of short-termism, that the industrial development agenda is just about some kind of uh, profit motive, I think, is, is just not the case. Um, as well as the work we've been doing now, uh, we've worked closely with Martin Frieda, who will be speaking later, and looking at vaccines and the feasibility of vaccine production in Africa. There's limited um, current production um, in Senegal. You've got one of only two pre-qualified yellow fever vaccine plants. Um, and there's some other biovac down in, in South Africa is, uh, I think, actually one of, I think you guys have a relationship with them, is that right? Anyway, so we, we've been doing some feasibility work looking at uh, what it would take for governments to establish um, viable uh, vaccine manufacturing across different types of vaccines. And there are a number of new vaccines come, that have come out recently, such as uh, the, the uh, pneumococcal vaccine, 12-valent, uh, 13-valent pneumococcal vaccine, um, um, and others, rotavirus vaccine, for example. And coming to the point um, on biosimilars, we have been approached recently by countries in the Andean region um, to look into how we can support them in building their ability to... Uh, a test to the quality of products in the marketplace. So one of the <coughs> area of expertise that you need to can bring to bear in this space is um, building uh, quality control infrastructure, laboratories, etc., within a country. But also looking beyond that to establishing the capacity to manufacture locally um, or within the region products, particularly the later generation. Marco was talking about monoclonals and the, the cost of the, these drugs. Um, and so they're particularly looking at mammalian cell line um, monoclonal antibodies for uh, yeah, rheumatoid arthritis, cancer, etc. So I think uh, it's probably common across most industrial development areas, but you have to, and as I said, inclusive and sustainable industrial development does see that you have to address a whole range of different issues. Um, within the work that we do in the pharmaceutical team, we have a number of different work streams, and I think they highlight some of the challenges that exist. So some of the work that we do is on developing strategies, both at the national level and at the regional level. So here I've listed Ghana, Kenya, Zimbabwe, Vietnam, and Myanmar. So we've done country-level strategies for, for these countries. Um, this that covers a number of different areas, but... One of the key things is governments have, different organs of government have to work together. You need the Ministry of Finance on board. You need the Ministry of Trade and Industry to be lobbying at Cabinet. You need the Ministry of Health to recognize the benefits, um, depending on how, where your regulatory authority sits, whether it's semi-autonomous or sits within the ministry, the regulator plays a critical part in this whole process. Um, so putting together a strategy, we've done that on a number of occasions. Then I think, uh, the PMPA business plan was something which we were asked to do by the AEC, and it was endorsed by heads of state and government in their, at their summit in July 2012. And we're working 
with WHO, UNAIDS, UNFPA, and various others to to bring this to, to put this into place. Uh, there have been quite a few developments, and uh, I'm not sure if I'll get the opportunity to talk about them too much today. But um, shall we say I'll come to some of the challenges which uh, are involved um, later on as well. The extent to which this will be a challenge in bio biosimilars, I'm not sure, but market data is a major limitation when it comes to small molecule um, pharmaceuticals and the industrial development in, in Africa and other developing and least developed countries. It relates or it ha hampers uh, investment. So banks have to do their due diligence and understand what sort of risks they're taking. Risk can, can either translate into no deal or a risk premium. Uh, it also affects the ability of companies to make strategic develop, um, decisions, plan for products, which formulations should they be developing, et cetera, et cetera. So we're doing some work in the EAC, the East African community, and also in Ghana. We've supported the, the development of trade associations, the Southern African Generic Medicines Association, and the Federation of African Pharmaceutical Manufacturers Associations. The thinking here is that the industry needs a voice and also needs to be represented. Um, now, we support them. They don't speak for us. We don't necessarily speak for them. But we have a close relationship with them. And I think the, the value of this work is, is, coming, is paying off this year because next month there will be a meeting of the Global Fund, which I'm sure you've heard of, which is one of the biggest procurers of ARVs, uh, ACTs for malaria and anti-TB drugs. They are convening a meeting in Addis Ababa for all African pharmaceutical manufacturers to discuss how manufacturers on the continent can supply the Global Fund. Um, it's likely that PEPFAR will be there, that UNFPA will be there, and that UNICEF will also be there. So, again, this is demonstrates that the international community is, sees the importance of um, local, high quality local production as a future source of supply. And there are many reasons for that, um, not least the changing dynamics from the Indian, uh, within the Indian market. Um, sorry, I'm probably taking too much time, so I'll move on pretty quickly. One of the things we, that is always key is human resource development. And there's a, an institution called St. Luke Foundation based at the Kilimanjaro uh, Institute, um, School of Pharmacy in Moshi in Tanzania. And we support an um, uh, advanced industrial pharmacy training course there. And we're also working with Mer Merck, the big U.S. Um, pharmaceutical company, um, and they're sponsoring a, a master's program in industrial pharmacy. One thing I think that I would like to touch on here is cost always comes into this. Price, access, everything else, cost is always going to be key. But there's a lot of dogma that exists, and people think that you know, India is such a cheap place to produce drugs. Now, India does have a lot of very good, ben, um, uh, does strong sort of basis for producing products at, at low cost. But there are the cost of production is not purely based on factors of production. There are the actual efficiency with which you produce a product can be very, very important. And there are processes and management techniques such as Lean Six Sigma, which, which make sure that, for example, you're not carrying excess um, inventory. So if you're funding your inventory and your sort of um, work in process, et cetera, at uh, 40%, which is the case in some developing countries, that's obviously going to cripple your, um, that will be very, very costly. But if you can really streamline your manufacturing processes, and it also comes down to some of the procurement practices which one would like to see put in place by governments and also by the international institutions, then the notion that the cost is purely a function of the, the cost of inputs plus some, something to do with economies of scale, I think is something that we can demonstrate or we can challenge fairly strongly. Um, so those are some of the interventions we've done. I'd like to mention one other one, which is a major work stream for us. Um, this, I think, and this is, again, I, I, I stand to be corrected, but I'm not sure this is relevant necessarily to the biosimilars. But one of the things we've been up to is what's no, what we call a GMP roadmap. So a lot of when you first starts in a country, you find that there are companies that are pretty much at international standards. There are some who aspire to international standards and have made investments. There are some entrepreneurs who are not so uh, interested in necessarily the quality of the products, more perhaps in the profit margin. And, and to be fair, it may not be a cynical sort of uh, profit-making 
uh, issue. It may just be that financing is too expensive, they can't get access to the, um, the technology or to the expertise. So the roadmap process basically establishes a stepwise um, pathway for companies to follow over a set period of time for them to meet international standards of production. Ultimately, for them to be WHO pre-qualified if they so wish. Um, I won't talk so much about what it actually involves, but just quite interesting that the um, Her Excellency, is that the right word, from Nigeria, has just been elected as the new Vice President. I'm going to be in uh, Lagos next week because we're, doing, we're implementing a regional a GMP roadmap approach with the West African Health Organization. And so I'll be talking to NAFDAQ and PMG Man next week in, in, in Lagos. Um, but the reason I say that this isn't necessarily appropriate for the um, biosimilar realm is that, as far as I understand it, by and large, we're talking about greenfield um, investments. For small molecules, as in Ghana, for example, there's been a pharmaceutical industry since 1950. So there's a lot of vested interest is a rather, um, is a rather negative word. But there's been a lot of, in many of the countries we go to, in Nigeria there's somewhere close to 200 companies which have been acting, or active for many, many years. So the, there's a lot of um, incumbents already in place and you have to work with that situation to, to uh, understand the challenges that companies and governments face and also to understand what their ambitions might be and how one can sort of encourage them along those lines. Biosimilars, as I say, is I think is more of a greenfield area where you're not talking necessarily about so many vested interests and perhaps it's more about um, the fight with the branded products and the, the originators more than the, um, the, the challenges that may, may exist because of the uh, long-standing history in developing countries. Uh, so as I said, challenges are multifaceted and therefore you require partnerships. Um, some of the issues that really need to be addressed are regulatory strengthening, um, building the human capital for the sector, access to, to technology, um, and then access to financing. The access to financing at the moment is one of the biggest challenges that we're looking to address. Um, so in commercial bank rates in Ghana, for example, can be something in the region of 28%. Uh, payback time in the industry is five, seven years. Um, and so you need long-term debt um, <clears throat> at affordable rates. And so we're working, I had a very interesting conversation with a, a lady representing some of the development finance institutions recently, and I think there's interest in this sector, but we have to bring it all together, and this requires collaboration. So we, as I said, we're the coordinating partner for the, <clears throat> the African Union Commission's uh, PMPA business plan. We're working closely with WHO in Ethiopia, um, on our respective mandates, and I was there last, last week talking um, with the state ministers for science and te technology, science for health, and WHO, and quite a few other stakeholders. And it, this will be, as I say, included and under the PCP um, with very close scrutiny from the Prime Minister. Uh, I think I mentioned earlier that we've been collaborating with WHO on what's called the African Vaccine Manufacturers Initiative. Um, on looking at feasibility, well, feasibility of production of different types of vaccine in, in Africa. And we also work very closely with other UN agencies such as UNAIDS, UNCTAD, UNFPA, and non-UN UN agencies as well. Um, so USP, for example, the United States Pharmacopeia, or the Pharmacopeia Convention, to give it its proper title, is another uh, significant player in this space. I think the demand for local production of biosimilars is, is likely to grow. And again, I, I look forward to being corrected or to, to further information because, as I say, this is relatively new to us. But from what we see, there is already very strong interest from the Andean region, and the project is under formulation, looking at both building the quality control infrastructure, but then longer term looking at establishing the local, local production of particularly the, the, the highest burden from an economic perspective products. As I said, well, I didn't say actually, Ethiopia, in, as one of its ambitions, it has uh, established um, the desire to put in place human insulin manufacturing. I think everyone is probably aware of the <coughs> changing socio socioeconomics um, in the developing world, 
the greater urbanization, um, the non-communicable diseases are becoming increasingly important. Obviously, we still face the uh, infectious disease challenges, but the NCDs, <coughs> I think, will shift and expand um, the focus <coughs> and ensuring access to affordable treatments for sort of cancer and inflammatory diseases, for example, is going to become increasingly more important. Um, and when the, sort of the gold standard treatment is a, a monoclonal, I think, particularly given some other developments I'll come on to, uh, it becomes increasingly sort of morally um, difficult to justify if uh, patients in the developing world are receiving sort of outdated technology, particularly when biosimilars could, um, under certain circumstances, help address these issues. I think the, the SDGs have created a, um, a new development framework and the emphasis is on sustainability. Um, now, one of the reasons the Global Fund is calling this meeting in, uh, in Addis is that they recognize that Global Fund donations, etc., can't go on forever. So what happens after you know, all these pre-qualified companies um, no longer have, or shall we say, the prerequisite for pre-qualification for ARVs is no longer um, there, and countries are, are sourcing their own products for these, for, for these um, diseases. Um, the likelihood is that, as with most national procurement processes, um, once a product has marketing authorization, it's usually down to a spot tender. Um, so they, the Global Fund recognizes that for continued impact, beyond the area of donations, it's going to be important to have high-quality sources of local supply uh, because these are going to be politically acceptable. And I think we can definitely make, make the argument that they will be financially viable as well. So there's also, as in the last couple of years, there's been the extension of the trip flexibilities uh, and exemptions out to 2033. Um, I'm no lawyer, so I don't know how this relates to biosimilars and the patents there. But I think it's f very pertinent in the context of the Secretary General's high-level panel on access to medicines, which reported last, I think it was September. And there was a strong emphasis in there about how trip flexibility should be utilized by, or and exemptions should be, there was a, it was morally imperative that developing countries and least developed countries should be enabled and allowed and supported to utilize the TRIPS flexibilities to improve access to medicines. Now, the one product that was a major lightning rod in those discussions, and I was on the expert advisory group, was Sofosfivir for hepatitis C. Now, this isn't a monoclonal, this isn't a biological, it's a small molecule compound, but it's priced at $1,000 a pill. And so it's $86,000 in the States for a 12-week course, I think it is. And so this raised huge amounts of, uh, of issues. Um, so the, now Gilead, the, the originator, has got a lot of um, licensing programs in place, particularly into India. But I think, um, as I say, uh, there's a lot of follow-up work going on now, looking into making sure that these excessive prices, um, which you could perhaps justify in some cases for, for monoclonals, given that the cost of actually developing them, that using the biosimilar approach, um, the cost of access can come down dramatically for developing and least developed countries. Um, and obviously you would be aware that the TRIPS flexibilities and exemptions depends on the economic status of a country. So the LDCs will be exempt until 2033, um, and then some of the other exemptions are available to, to all countries. So looking forward, I think the experience that we've had, so many of the challenges are going to be the same for the biosimilars. Um, developing regulations for biosimilars and the capacity to oversee their quality, I think that's a challenge in small molecules, but it will also be a challenge in the realm of biosimilars. Human resources for production and for regulation, uh, again, uh, is, is, is a challenge. Then we have standard access to technology, access to capital, uh, in many of these products, and again, I stand to be corrected, but I believe many of these products need cold chains, um, and these are often not in place outside of the EPI programs, um, so that can often be a challenge. I think the cost of clinical studies to demonstrate the equivalence and or, sorry, the equivalence or the similarity, 
in small molecules or in, um, in uh, biosimilars can be really quite excessive and certainly can be a major barrier for, for local producers. And I don't know, Martin may talk about this later, because I know that he has some, uh, some thoughts on possible ways that the regulatory pathways could be streamlined. Um, and in the small molecule realm, we're looking at using technology transfer, um, because then clinical studies aren't necessarily required, and you can demonstrate bioequivalence on the basis of uh, comparative dissolution, for example. Um, I think it's a bit of an obvious statement, but sometimes the health systems are weak and you have a limited number of medical professionals. I think the products we're talking about here generally would be uh, require close medical supervision. And therefore, I remember I lived in Malawi for a few years and I think there are 100 doctors in the country for 13 million people. Um, so there are issues in the, at the healthcare system level as well. Um, So just a final thought, and this I think really is where I'm probably out of my depth, but um, certainly seems that the biosimilar realm is technically at least, but probably more, much more challenging than um, the, the work that we're doing in, bio, in uh, small molecules. But I suspect, and this is, I go back to my comment about um, Greenfield, a lot of this is about Greenfield and, and starting with a fairly clean slate. I suspect or I hope that the political um, inertia wouldn't necessarily be there when it comes to the biologicals. Because from what we've learned, you know, working out the why and the what, it's not, it's not rocket science necessarily. Why are we going to do this? Improve access and a few other benefits. What are we going to do? We're going to make them locally. We're going to make sure that the incentives are in place. Working, um, sorry that um, uh, the quality is right, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But how do you actually do that? And who who does it? Those and how how do you get those different organisations, people to collaborate? That can be a real challenge. Obviously, a key issue, which I'm sure you've touched on over the last two days, is resources, and those are always going to be. Um, access to resources to support technical assistance is always going to be key. But um, as I say, I think the, the theoretical notion of what needs to be done is the first step. But to actually implement it in practice is, is really is a challenge and it really requires well-conceived um, collaborations between institutions who are aligned in their philosoph philosophy and their objectives, um, and the, the political will is there to support the people in the trenches, shall we say. And on that note, thank you.